Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whenever you're listening. Welcome to Running with the Bulls podcast, Adam and Josh. Back at it again, and it's a not quite a double header, but it's a back to back uh, for us on the schedule, Josh. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton that happened the last couple of days, but we had, I would say, even more news that dropped today than than even dropped yesterday. We had tons of re-signings. We had tons of signings. We even had a surprise signing, an end of an era in the NBA that just occurred today, and we got a lot to discuss. Actually, yeah, absolutely, eras that are ending today. Well, I think it was like that first chip to fall had to be the Paul George thing. I think a lot of teams were suitors for him. And usually in free agency, it's like, all right, that first chip falls and then everything happens after like that year, you know, everyone waited till see what LeBron does. And then everything started to roll. Um, also, that's that- kind of like paints a picture of what kind of year in free agency it is. Like Paul George is a really nice player, but he's not going to lead you to a championship. He can be a good player on a championship team, perhaps, but um, you know, But anyway, we'll get to the rest of the league. But first, let's start with the Chicago Bulls. Uh, We talked about yesterday, we wanted them to get a young big man, and they got one, Jalen Smith. You know, I really like this move. Jalen is a very young and -and up-and-coming center. Um, he He didn't have the most playing time last year. He only averaged 17 minutes a game. But what he did in those 17 minutes was phenomenal. Uh, Shot 59% from the floor, 42% from three, 10 points, five and a half rebounds. You know, the only thing that you could say was a concern was he did not see the floor um, in the playoffs. He only played in six games, only played about eight minutes a game in the playoffs. But overall, you look at a guy like that, this is a young center that can develop. And I think this is a very good find for the Bulls. In fact, if you look even closer um, at his at his stats, if you look at his per 36-minute stats. You're exactly – that's what I'm looking at, and they're nice. They're very nice. You know, last year in – he's averaging, if I have it correct here, his per 36-minute stats from last year, 21 points per game, 12 rebounds. Yep. I mean, that speaks for itself in terms of now it also speaks to the efficiency of the offense in today's NBA. But regardless, this is a guy you could put in the starting lineup and he very well could get you 15 points and eight rebounds a game right away. The only question we're going to have is what how is his defense going to translate? And what I think the Bulls here are doing, and this is what I am starting to see them do, is they are developing a team very much like they were trying to build with Lonzo Ball a running gun style team. And I feel like that that's what they're trying to build a young team. Maybe the defense isn't very good, but they're going to score a lot of points. They're going to get a lot of transition baskets. They're going to run up and down the floor and there's going to be a lot of pace to their offense. And I think that's just fun basketball too. You know, like wins and losses aside, it's fun to be fun. You know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. And I, I think for this year's, like, as a Bulls fan, my wish is for them to be fun and young. I don't expect them to necessarily win a ton because I do think that they're going to kind of keep going through with this rebuild. More pieces will come off uh, is my prediction. But, yeah, to get a guy like Jalen Smith who has goggles – you know, little Horace Grant flair, if you will. Maybe they're glasses, maybe they're goggles, whatever it is. I, I like that. Um, but one thing that kind of sticks out to me, in addition to the things you said, is uh, just field goal percentages last season. That really stands 9% out. percent field goal percentage, 42 from three. And so when you look at kind of one of the big things that – was not great with the Bulls in recent years was not just like super efficient from shooting from three, but also not very many attempts, which just in the analytics era isn't going to win you a ton of basketball games. Uh, Jalen Smith, as, as you alluded to, as far as like the Bulls intended style coming up this year, coming from 
that breakneck speed pacer system, a guy who's going to spread the floor, a guy who's going to be able to ho hopefully get up and down the way the the uh, Bulls want to next season. Yeah, and I just think that that's going to be the style we're going to see. For me, I don't mind a team that wins 30 games. As long as I can see the young talent progressing. Yeah. If I see that, like when the Bulls weren't good, I had fun watching Laurie Markkinen. I had fun watching Daniel Gafford. I had fun watching guys who, you know, maybe they weren't going to lead you to the playoffs, but they were going to be like, oh, this guy could be a cornerstone for this team, or this guy could be a piece for the Bulls when they finally make the playoffs. Those are the things you look for. Like back when the Bulls weren't really good in the early 2000s, you, you kind of had fun watching Ron Artest. You enjoyed yeah. watching Tyson. You enjoyed watching Jamal Crawford drop 50 points on a random night against the Raptors. You know, you enjoyed that kind of stuff. Um, speaking of which, I remember that game because I was at my grandmother's house. I remember that game. <laughs> That's awesome. I was literally watching in their room. <laughs> Actually, it was my Bubby's house. But anyway, um, so, but this is the kind of stuff we're going to see from the bulls. This is a signing towards being younger and going towards the future. And the main thing you're going to want to see is just the development of the young guys. Yeah. You know, who's the, the thing is, I just wish they didn't have Vuta on the, on, on the payroll, Levine Lonzo, because you could just start Jalen Smith. You could start fresh. You could, you could sign another center if you wanted to, just to be the backup big man, you could sign Tony Bradley again for all I care. I don't care who you Not sign. Tony Bradley, I'm putting my foot down. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, you could, yeah. You can sign Granville Waiters. I don't care. Just, you know, just tank for 2025. I'm fine with that. I, it's uh, just, the point and, is I want to see I what like, you know, now I'm, I'm looking at the roster and they've hardly done anything. Let's not get out of ourselves. Like, you know, this is literally like, their first signing, but just looking at 24 years old, Jalen Smith, 24 year olds, old Kobe white, 23 years old, Patrick Williams, 22 years old, Josh Giddy, 25 year olds, Io Dosumu. They're getting younger, you know, and like, hopefully Julian Phillips and Dalen Terry are able to take another step forward. Uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens um, with, Levine and uh, Vucevic. And I think, you know, interestingly enough, <laughs> it, it, Lonzo Ball at this point could be found money. Like, they're not going to be able to trade him. The contract's not awful. It, it expires this year. But if Lonzo's good, I love him. Like, I, I love Lonzo Ball as a basketball player. He, even though he hasn't been healthy, like the small amount of time he was on the floor for the Bulls, he was just a really, really fun player that was easy to root for. And you know what? He's only 27. And so I'm rooting for him. I don't hate that he's still on the team. What I would hate to see is if the Bulls just dumped him because at this point, like you don't have anything to lose by seeing what you have in him. And I think that like realistically, he can be a solid backup guard, um, and and you, you you see what you got. But like they got a lot of guys under thirty. Uh, Lonzo's the oldest of all the guys I mentioned, so I like that they're getting younger. I can kind of see the young core starting to form, but it's like you know you still got to peel back the layers, if you will, that are Vucevic and Levine, and kind of get rid of some of the uh, older guys to see what it's really going to look like. I really feel like Booch, I feel like that's a problem. I don't know if Jalen, I wouldn't consider Jalen Smith a starting caliber center in this league. No. But when you're a young team, not trying to win, you can afford to have a guy like Jalen Smith start. Yeah. You can have Vooch start, that's fine. But here's the difference between him and Jalen Smith. Jalen Smith probably could get you 15 and eight and be more efficient than Vooch. And Vooch will get you 16 and 12, but he's going to shoot about, he's going to shoot 30% from three. Whereas Jalen Smith, if he's shooting even more shots, 
he'll probably shoot 37, 38% from three. And that has more value than what Vooch is providing. Now, I will say this. For a guy who is going to average what Vucevic averages, and mind you, this was actually his worst season from three since he started shooting threes in the in his career. In fact, two of his three worst seasons shooting the three-point pointer have been as a member of the Chicago Bulls, um, which is very frustrating. But last year, Vucevic averaged 18 and 10 and a half. Like for a guy who's averaging 18 and 10 to get him at $20 million is pretty darn, is a pretty darn good value contract. Yeah, it's, it's honestly not a bad contract at all. It's really not. It kind of fits what he's worth because if he was a good defensive center, you'd be getting 30 million out of it. And he'd be one of the 10, he'd be one of the most valuable centers in the league by far. But Vooch is not known for his defense whatsoever. He's known for spiking the ball on Pau Gasol's head. That he's known for, but that was in Orlando. <laughs> if the Bulls were buyers, he'd be a fine guy to keep at that value. But he's just not worth what they need. And I think you and I can agree that I want to see Vooch playing less than 30 minutes a night next year. 25. And I want to see Jalen Smith playing at least 20 minutes a night. Yeah. Because they underplayed Drummond by far. In fact, I would have started Andre Drummond over Vucevic on a lot of occasions, a lot yeah. more, because I feel like Andre Drummond is a better center than Vucevic. Because I, Andre Drummond yeah. can still score 20 points and get you 18 rebounds. Andre I'm, Drummond's anyway. literally still the best rebounder in the NBA. I would argue that he is. And if he you is. look at, and the reason why he's so he's so much broader than everybody else when he's boxing out, he's just such a big body, you can't contend with a guy like that. Yep. And so for someone like that, I really feel like you know the Bulls. When they got Andre Drummond, I thought they were getting a steal of a center because who, by the way, made one of the worst financial decisions of all one of the worst in terms of NBA players to ever be done. But that's beside the point. You know, it's just that now we need to see the youth movement. And I think one of the ways that they're getting rid and moving towards that youth movement is moving on. And I think this is a good way to segue is moving on from Mr. Fourth Quarter, DeMar DeRozan. Mm -hmm. Because now that you've got this signing, now that you've traded for Josh Giddy, Joe Cowley reported that this was the final straw. I respect a lot of Joe Cowley. He's more of a he's more of a stirring the pot kind of guy. I'm more of a Casey Johnson follower, always have been. But when Cowley has something to say, you listen to it. And I agree with him that DeMar was never coming back. I never thought he was coming back. But DeMar is in a bit of a pickle here because it sounds like he's going to actually have to take a pay cut. The Bulls offer him a two-year contract for $80 million back in April. He turned it down, and now his reports are out there. He's going to have to take less money, and the reports are it's either going to be the Lakers or the Clippers, another team potentially. The Clippers, not as likely, but it sounds like the Lakers are the big favorite to get him. So what I'm curious of is what would you like to see if, say, the Bulls made a sign-in trade? If you were going to get – the reports are it's between the Nets, the Lakers, and the Bulls if they sign if he signs with the Bulls and then they trade him. The Nets would take on some of the salary. Who would you want to see in a sign and trade with DeMar? Because remember, you're not really going to get much back, but maybe you can get like you're not going to get I don't know if you're going to get a Rory Hachimura or anything like that. But if you could hypothetically get anybody, who do you think, Adam? Let me pull up the Lakers roster and who's on their books right now. If I could get anybody to be Rui Hachimura, that would be who I would want in return. And I think that's fair value. Like, definitely. If I was the Bulls, like, I'm not accepting anything less than I Rui. Agree. Because you you need to think about, like, the leverage uh, the Bulls have if they were to, in, like, get into, you got to understand, like, the other person's perspective when they're looking at, you from across the negotiation table, right? Like Rui's 26. He's a helpful player for them for sure. But DeMar's a massive upgrade. The Bulls get a good power forward, 26 years old, that's on the books for another year, 17 this year, 18 next year. Um, I mean... Maybe you get like Cam Reddish or you something. You know who I'd, I'd love actually is Jared Vanderbilt. <laughs> Jared would be fine. He's just not a good, he's not, he's, 
I wouldn't call him Mr. Shooter. No, he's a good but defender. he's, I, you know, I don't think he's a, I, I got to pull up his numbers because I feel like he's not a bad shooter either. That he shot 30%. Team, he shot just about as bad as Vooch from three, except he only shot one per game. He can't shoot. He can defend like crazy. Don't get me wrong. He can defend. He's a very good defender. He can defend multiple positions. Um, I would say, you know, a guy like that, you know, he's still young. He's yeah, he's 25, like, super versatile defender. Um, I'd I'm be gonna fine pull up his, his like kind of per 36 here. And yeah, like he he didn't have great re rebounding numbers last year, only 8.6 per 36, but like you know. Per 36 minutes, going back to when he was 21 years old in 2021, like 11.6, then it's 11.9, 11.2, 11.7, 10, and then 8.6 last year. So he's he's a 25-year-old, versatile rebounder, uh, somebody who would be able to, like, make sense over, uh, you know, the next few years, maybe stick around for a while for the Bulls. Uh, and... He just plays super hard. I think like one thing I really want to restore to the Bulls franchise is just like a sense of grit. All the really good Bulls teams ever, really, it's been about, gritty. they've all been gritty, you know? And like, we've seen that in flashes with some of these Donovan teams, but like, I want the Bulls to be really tough I, I, like even if they're not good, just be tough. Um, we're losing probably the toughest player from last year's roster in Caruso. And I'm all about like, if they could get Vanderbilt and Rui, and I don't know if that's realistic, I'd be thrilled. Now I want to ask you um, another question. How long do you think Billy Donovan is going to last as head coach? Cause I don't think he's going to last the whole contract. I think that he, might have even like saved his own job this year. Uh, Cause there was a point where his seat was super hot and then the bulls kind of figured it out. Uh, and so I think it's very interesting when you kind of monitor that situation, because like we said before, when we talked about it um, over text message, I said, Hey, here's the thing is they could do a lot worse, you know? And, and that is how I feel about it, is they could do a lot worse. So if you are able to upgrade somehow, great. But like, you know, who I would have loved Mike Budenholzer. You know, he's gone. That would have been a great hire. That would have been. You know, it's just, I, I, I will say this, and I think we can agree. The Bulls are trying their best to commit to something. Yeah, they were committed. They were trying to commit to a winning strategy that wasn't working. Now they're trying to commit to a rebuild or at least a minor rebuild for at least 2025. And I am okay in 2026, I would say. And I'm okay with that. But you got to be fully committed. And I think what happened before, and we saw it, was when they tried to rebuild just a few years ago, just how bad it was. And they quickly, and we saw the fruits bear from the tree of that retool and then eventually signing DeMar and all those things we saw the result they started 29 and 10 best record in the eastern conference Lonzo Ball goes down they lose him for the whole season and then the whole thing just fell apart now regardless it and it's still it still bothers me they started 29 and 10 and then it just and then you finish the way they finished 17 and 26, but we saw it didn't work. They realize now they made a mistake, bringing it back. And so you're kind of scrambling a little bit, but overall you're giving tomorrow what he wants, which is a new lease on life somewhere else. It's much needed. And I think now we can put this whole era behind us and, you know, see what they can do. I mean, but they have to find a way I feel to if they're going to keep Billy Donovan, let him try and develop the young talent. I, I don't see where Zach Levine fits in. Vooch doesn't fit in. So I want to see what Billy Donovan can do with a winning roster because the reality is he's never been 
He's only coached a rebuilding team one season. And that one season was the year before they got DeMar DeRozan. And they traded for Vooch that season. And the Bulls weren't even that bad of a team. They won 31 games. They weren't really that bad of a team. I wouldn't even call it. I, I would That was kind of a retooling team, so to speak, almost. They were kind of putting more pieces in. So this will be interesting to see how he does with young talent. Because when he was in OKC, he had Russell Westbrook. He had Paul George. He had Kevin Durant. Um, I believe it was just for that one season that he had Kevin Durant. But regardless... You know, this is a guy who's known for having talent, used to having talent. So when you have a deficit of that, you know, how is he going to respond and how is his coaching going to translate for the other players? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, how is he going to develop the talent without other guys kind of eating up all those minutes? I mean, it's all interesting. It's also, like, just worth noting. Uh, and then I think let's move on to some other – uh Yes, I agree. Teams, but I think it's worth noting that, like, yeah, we suspect that the Bulls are going to move on from DeRozan and Vucevic, but, like, we don't know. Maybe they're both back next year. You know, like, uh, right now when I, I'm looking like DeRozan, it's like Lakers, Clippers, and Sixers are the teams I'm seeing. And I think the Sixers noise is getting quiet fast after they've already made their big splash, you know. But, like, uh. I wouldn't be shocked if the Bulls did bring him back. You know, I know what Cowley's saying out there and like, but you just don't know. I feel like, uh, I don't know. It wouldn't shock me. I don't really want him back. <laughs> I don't like, really either. I would prefer a sign and trade scenario, but um, I think that, you know, cause we're talking about like a rebuild and that's what we want, but we are kind of still technically in wait and see mode until we see one of those guys actually get unloaded. I'm just waiting for the Woj bomb. Yeah. We're all waiting for the Woj bomb at this point, but I think we got most of the Woj bombs the last two days. Yeah. And we got to talk about those Woj bombs. We had first big Woj bomb was middle of the night. Paul George signs with the Philadelphia 76ers. Kelly Oubre also stays with them and Tyrese Maxey re-signs on a four-year, I believe it was a four-year deal if I have it right. It was a four-year deal for 204, it might have been a five-year deal for 204. Regardless, you now have a Philly team that, do you think they can make it out of the second round and get rid of the curse? Can they get out of the second round? Does the process still have legs? Because I feel like the process fell off the wagon the second Jimmy Butler left. Now you're getting kind of a Jimmy Butler-esque player here, but you're getting him years late, five years after the fact, six, or even six years after the fact, basically, you're getting him. A uh, four-year, $212 million deal with Thank George. Thank you, sir. Um, but right now, like, who's actually on their roster? Because they had, like, I they feel like that whole nobody. thing was expiring contracts. So looking at it where it stands right now, you know, they, they picked up Eric Gordon, frankly, don't care. Don't think he's that good anymore. Uh, Andre Drummond. They still got Paul Reed. I like the Kelly Oubre move, dude. I like the Oubre move. I agree. I think that really helps Maxie, George and Bede. They need more. Um, Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised like, if Kyle Lowry comes back on the vet minimum. I would not be surprised by that. Yeah, especially being a, a Philly guy. But you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if they still go after uh, DeRozan. I don't know uh, if they have the money, man. To I, do I don't know if they do have the money. and It's a little... Uh, a little confusing looking at some of their cap holds and stuff. But they're not done. Well, I guess, you know, they can't, they, no, they can't get to Rosen. They, they have, they are, no, they're not a contender. Let me just get that out of the way. So 36% of their cap is Embiid at 51 million, 35 at 49 million is Paul George. And then 25% of their cap at 35 million is Tyrese Maxey. And so you're filling out the rest of the roster at this point. It's Ubre, Paul Reed, Andre Drummond, Eric Gordon, and they're going to get some vet minimums, I'm sure. No, no. This no. team is way too thin to contend. Too it's thin. And Bede always gets hurt. I don't uh, 
I don't appreciate, I don't think that guy's got much like, I don't think he's a championship piece. I just don't. And I, I think he's, he's a really, really good player and he can like win it. I shouldn't say not a championship piece, but like, he's not a leader, dude. He's not a leader. He's very selfish. He, he constantly is throwing his teammates under the bus. I get I that James Harden was probably a guy who was hard to play with, but you know, it seemed like almost every year it's Embiid with excuses and throwing teammates under the bus. So I'm not impressed by that kind of behavior. I don't think that's good leadership. Um, and that's a problem when you get into the games. playoffs. He's never played 70 games in a season. So he's not reliable. You're, you're bringing in Paul George year. who has uh, like, you know, he has a history of injuries. He had one of the grossest injuries ever you know why did you have to bring that back up in my memory i literally remember i literally just popped in my head i remember it like it was yesterday it, it, they're gonna be a really good team celtics are better knicks are better pacers are probably better and the bucks are better did you say the knicks yeah i mean i just don't see where if Embiid is playing 50 games they're a six seed if he plays 82 games it could be a f- a three seed. It could be a three Embi- seed. If they do not have Joel Embiid, he- I will say this. Having Andre Drummond as your center to replace Joel Embiid if you need it is very, very helpful. Andre Drummond might have the most value at the back of center position in all the NBA next to Nas Reed next year because he's going to get so many starts when Embiid is down. Because we know he's going down. Yeah. We, we just know that. I mean, he. It, it's like, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that episode um, of SpongeBob where the guy's in a full body cast in the chocolate episode. That's kind of yeah. what Joel Embiid is at this point. I was born with glass bones and paper skin. So, you know, it's that's kind of what Joel Embiid is, glass bones and paper skin. And we, you can't rely on something like that. You the, the Trailblazers couldn't rely on Bill Walton. They got one good season out of him. They got one healthy season out of them and were able to win a championship. If you got that out of Joel Embiid when things were going well, you may have won a championship, but he's not reliable. He always gets hurt. So yeah. it's nice, but are you going to rely on Andre Drummond as your center for 50 games, starting 50 games, and be able to still make it to a top five seed? I just don't see it. No, no, I don't. Uh, Clay Thompson is, this is a, a Dallas Maverick. Just so Dallas fun. Just made the NBA finals and got better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we need to discuss this because I really love what Dallas did. I think they got a lot of upgrades. You replace, you got it. You had a lot of replacements on that team. Now you've got more depth. You had to trade Josh green, a very nice young player, but in return, you get one of the greatest shooters of all time. He's not the defender. He once was, but 18 Look, points they, a game last year. But Clay is going to put up an efficient 15 to 18 points a game for you. It's going to yep. be efficient. And that is still incredibly important. If we look at his stats last year, listen, you can say what you want about the guy. The year before this, he averaged 22 points a game and was shooting just as well as he normally does. His shooting splits really not all that different than it was last year, than it was the year before when he was playing like an all-star. Um, he averaged 18 points a game. He shot 43% from the field, 39% from three, which is actually one of, believe it or not, his two worst seasons from three in his career, which says a lot about him. So a down year for him is shooting 30, almost 39% from three. But if you're getting a guy who's going to shoot 40% from three coming off screens on a team that has two ball dominant players, that is going to take a lot of pressure off of Luca and Kyrie, because there's yep. going to be nights where Clay is still going to be able to go off for 20 to 25 points. There's and many times good. Clay Thompson is so wide open, and the choice the defense is going to have to make in rotation when it's like, who do you want to kill, or, or, or who, who's going to kill us? You know, like it's pick your poison. Exactly, Kyrie Irving. Clay Thompson or Luka Doncic. And one thing I love about not just the Clay Thompson signing for the Mavericks, but the Mavericks as a whole, as far as like how dangerous they are right now, 
Luka Doncic is 25. Kyrie is 32. Clay is 34. And then you look at the other really important players on this team. P.J. Washington is 26. Daniel Gafford is 26. Derek Lively is 20. Like, Jalen Hardy is 22. They have Josh a lot of young, young pieces on this team. Yeah. And I think that you know, that's going to go a long way for this team. I can very well see them back in the Western Conference Finals. You know, the only thing when it comes to them is you lose a defender like Derek Jones Jr., how significant of a loss is that going to be? You lose him. He signed with the Clippers, if I remember correctly, signed with them for three years, $30 million. So that's a big loss on the defensive end. You know, how much can Clay really help you on the defensive end at this point as his aging? But this team's going to score a lot of points. Yep. A lot of points. And I think that right now you can make an argument, especially with Denver losing KCP. You know, you're looking at a team like, you know, Dallas. It's OKC, it's Dallas, and it's Minnesota. And those are your top three teams right now in the Western Conference. I would say Denver is now that fourth team, maybe even fifth because they've lost so much depth and they struggled so much last year, bench depth wise. Now you're losing KCP. So I really think that Dallas has really cemented themselves as one of the top three teams in the West. And I expect them fully to win 50. I would say 53 to 57 games next year. They won 50 last year. If I remember correctly, I I would agree with that. I mean, if, if the nuggets are going to like tread water or like get better, then Michael Porter Jr. needs to be an all-star. And Jamal Murray needs to be an all-star. You know, the core of Jokic, Murray, Porter, Gordon. And I love Christian Brown, just for the record. Big Christian Brown guy. He's He's a wonderful player. I would be so happy. If we're talking like sign-in trades, give me Christian Brown, (laughs) Zeke Najee, and you know a uh some some coupons to some good denver restaurants or something and we'll talk you know but no that's like all jokes aside like christian brown is i think going to surprise a lot of people by his ability to step into that kcp role i think he's a guy who's gotten better every year i think he plays his tail off on defense he's just a grinder um, so I, I do think he'll be good, but yeah, like other teams are getting better. Um, one team I want to talk about was the Clippers, Kevin Porter Jr. Really good basketball player. Maybe not a great person. Yeah. Um, I don't think this guy should be in the NBA. I, I don't think but... you deserve to come back to the NBA after you do what you did to your girlfriend. You're also known yeah. as a locker room cancer. He, he's he gotten like asked to leave every team he's been on. I have a, I have a good question. And, and this is something. How, why is Kevin Porter Jr. getting a contract and John Wall hasn't gotten a one-year deal from somebody? I still don't know why. John still Wall. Still facing charges. Second degree strangulation, third degree assault. Oh, what a lovely guy. What a wonderful human being. You completely deserve to be in one of the professional sports leagues in America that pays so much money. You totally deserve not to have, you know, go shipped off to Siberia to play basketball. He got, no, a, he got a plea no. deal in January. That's the little update on Kevin Porter Jr. You know what? I think he's going to ruin that team. He very well might. And you know what? They have themselves to blame if that's the case. That's your fault if that's what happens. If, and, if it's like 2K where you can just turn chemistry off, really good pickup. But it's not. You can't turn off chemistry. Chemistry is just... such a pain to the butt in that game. Oh, you know, it is. It is. But, like, it's realistic when you look at stuff like this where, like, yeah, you put in somebody who's not going to get along with your teammates. It's going to cause issues. Major issues. Yeah. Major, major issues. And I just – I really don't like what they're doing. I, I disagree with it, but we'll see what happens. But when you bring in a locker room guy like that, it only generally leads to trouble. Yeah. Only it really only does as much as you don't want it to, you know, it's almost, you know, like 
you can argue almost like I'm not saying this, but when someone becomes more problematic in the locker room and actually hurts you more than helps you. Oh, I completely agree. A guy that I'm thinking of, and this is just a guy I'm thinking of. Guy like Kevin Durant, when he goes somewhere, it generally even when he's a superstar, it he's not helping anybody. You know, he's not. He was really passive in the playoffs. And what have I been saying, Joshy boy? I've been saying I'd rather have Mikel Bridges on my team than Kevin Durant. You got to the finals with Mikel Bridges. You got to the finals with him because he played his role perfectly. You had a really good setup because you Doesn't have seen- miss games, shoots the lights out, plays great defense, unselfish. That's a championship piece. And KD is more worried about his burner Twitter account than he is about winning basketball games. So, and as um as Charles Barkley said, he he should focus more on eating some hamburgers and beefing up a little bit than actually you know doing what he does. But um, you know it, you're not winning. You're just you're not winning with KD. KD's not a winner. You know why KD won two rings? Because he went to the greatest dynasty in modern sports besides yeah. the New England Patriots. Yeah. Okay? Or, or the Kansas City Chiefs, basically, at this point now, unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, it. the point is, he had to go to a team that won 73 games to win two championships. And he hasn't done anything with his career since then. And he... It's just it just goes to show that when you are a big ego that's not a leader, it's going to hurt more than help. And I feel like to win a championship, you need leadership and talent. And it's like, not a it, it takes sacrifice, man. You know, KD is not a leader by any stretch of the imagination. It's he doesn't never- come off like one. And no. uh, yeah, you know, he, he's he's demonstrated some weird uh, moments. Uh, a little bit of time left here. Let's go rapid fire. Mo Bamba to the Clippers. All right, that's cool. Great Dawson. song. Decent, decent song. Less than decent player. Okay, move on. We no, got no. a big thing. Gary we Harris got back to the Magic. The- All right, cool. Whatever. Isaiah um, Hartenstein. We got to talk about that for just a second. Yeah, yeah, dude. That is the most loaded team in the NBA. I think they're better than the Celtics now. I think I think they're really good. I also wonder if uh, it's going to be the old Thibodeau treatment where Thibodeau makes somebody look really, 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 really good because he's so good at developing talent. And then he goes here, earns that contract, and maybe falls off a little bit because he's not under Thibodeau's tutelage. I want to ask you, was that an overpay? What was the numbers? I think three years, $86 million. Three years, $86 million? Yeah. I believe- it's an overpay. Yeah. I don't, I, w- when I saw the numbers, I was like, for his numbers, you're going to trade for that? Yeah. For three years, $87 million for yeah. that. It's a little steep. A little steep. He played really well last year. The Knicks aren't going to miss him too much, though. I don't understand why you're paying a guy almost $30 million to not even average 10 points. He's averaging eight points a game and eight rebounds, and that gets $30 million a year. What a career. What a life. What a show. What a time. That's all we got for uh, now. Closing thoughts, Josh. Another great show, and I'm excited to talk more Bulls with you, man, once we get more down the line, especially when DeMar gets traded. If he's (laughs) traded. or We'll see what happens. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for listening. Give us a like if you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next time.